This session is uh, called Playwrights Under the Radar. It is um, kind of a variation of a annual session that we have done called Hot Topics, uh, but this one focuses um, mainly on presenting uh, playwrights. Uh, we more or, more or less call them more local playwrights that uh, that we feel need a little bit more exposure, and it's time to get. Their, get their names out there so we can get to know them a little bit better. Uh, so I have uh, 10, uh, we have 10 presenters today who are going to uh, share some of their favorite playwrights and creators, uh, some of the work that they've done, and maybe even share a little bit of uh, information about how you can connect with those individuals and check out work for yourselves. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed from talking to the presenters uh, prior to this is uh, many of these individuals are on the new play exchange and we would like to get, take some time to talk about that afterwards as we need to uh, but the new play exchange is a great source that uh, you all should know about and um, it's great that many of these individuals are on there so that is another way to connect but uh, especially if you've received a handout slash program, um, you have some, some contact information for many of these individuals and uh, I will welcome and encourage you to uh, uh, kind of reach out to our presenters who know more about these individuals and they can probably help share some information about them as well. So um, this conference overall, especially for those of you who are here for the first time, is really about uh, networking is a huge thing, and it's really cool because dramaturgs, from my experience, are, are even though they admit at times that they can be introverted, they're actually very approachable. Um, so, so, um, so please uh, uh, reach out to uh, any of these individuals at the conference, have a conversation, get some coffee, tea, etc., and uh, and just and get to know each other. Uh, that's how we. Uh, engage and we uh, make ourselves better um, in, in what we do so we can make our work better wherever we are. So, um, oh, hi, my name is Brian Moore. <laughs> uh, by the end of this conference, I will be the uh, incoming president elect uh, for the LMBA. <laughs> Pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I am at uh, Concordia University in Nebraska, um, the uh, theater professor, chair of the theater department, department of one, et cetera. So um, I'm happy and excited to present this uh, panel and uh, we are about ready to roll. Uh, a handful of our uh, uh, presenters have handouts and we will try to get those to you either just before, or, you know, just as they're starting or immediately after. Um, they are done. Uh, we do have a kind of a strict timetable, timeline, or um, um, time uh, that we ask them to present in. Um, they need to give their presentation in five minutes, and it's five minutes. So, uh, what's going to happen is uh, Lavinia is going to um, be our timekeeper. Uh, she's going to be the one who's basically going to tell you when you have one minute left. And she is being even nicer to tell you when you've got about 15 seconds left, she's going to like whatever, hands in the air. And then she is going to be not so nice and tell you you're done. Let's hope you don't get to that point. So it's great when you can conclude yourself and not have, or have to tell you when you're done. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, and I don't know who's first. It's Catherine, isn't it? Yes, uh, Catherine Malachi. Thank you. Uh, 
So my name is Catherine, pronounced she, her. I'm from the Great Canadian Theatre Company in Ottawa. And I have the pleasure today of talking about my friend and a very talented playwright, Matt Hurtendy. So Matt is a playwright, actor, and producer born and raised in Ottawa. His new play, Rideshares and Rope Swings, received the 2016 Prix Rideau Award for Outstanding New Creation. That same year, he was also voted Emerging Artist of the Year. Rideshares and Rope Swings has been produced as far as Halifax and Philadelphia. Matt is an instructor in acting and playwriting at the Ottawa Acting Company, where he is also assistant dramaturg for the Emerging Creators Unit, which happens to be my project. So. <laughs> Uh, he also serves as a dramaturgy mentor for the Youth Infringement Festival. On uh, his next project, he will be collaborating with fellow Ottawa-based creator Monica Bradford Lee on the development of a new play based on Hitchbot, which is the real-life story of a robot that hitchhiked from Halifax to Victoria, so coast to coast in Canada, uh, with the generous support of the Ontario Arts Council. So I would like to talk about two of his projects, just really quickly. Uh, the first of which is called Swedish Furniture, and it premiered at the Tactics Festival this past April in Ottawa. It was directed by Katie McNeil. So Swedish Furniture takes the audience into the bedroom of a modern-day millennial couple. Their frustration with each other, gender constructs and expectations, the economy, education, and entering the workforce all boil to a head as they face the fiercest challenge a couple can face. Assembling an Ikea bed. <laughs> part lampoon, part pointed exploration of modern love, Swedish Furniture is a compassionate and hilarious cautionary tale with Ikea furniture assembled live on stage. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and then Ride Shares and Road Swings, so it premiered at the Ottawa Fringe Festival in 2016, and it actually was a part of the inaugural Emerging Creators Unit that uh, I founded in Ottawa, also in 2016. So I had a little bit of a hand in the development of this project. It was directed by Matt Venner, who is, is the other Matt's creative partner. Together they form uh, two kind boys. Yes, their names are both Matt. No, it's not confusing. Uh, so this play asks, what does anyone gain from only seeing two stars in their whole lifetime? A rideshare agreement goes awry, forcing two troubled strangers to spend time in the great eastern Ontario wilderness getting to know each other, or worse, themselves. Mm -hmm. David Curry of Apartment 613 said, The script for Rice Shares and Rope Swings is a brilliant work, well-balanced and sincere. Matt's honest writing explores what is bet in between intimacy and death. The jokes land, the drama pushes the audiences further and further into the themes of the play. It's simply a delight to watch. And also, I would be remiss not to mention that he is on the New Play Exchange, and I, the, I think I left his email address on the list there. So thank you, everyone. That is my good friend, Matt Hurtendy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up, Amber Bradshaw. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to be reading off my phone, but I didn't finish, so I don't have it printed. Okay. I met Daryl Lisa Fazio in 2011 when we connected to collaborate on her play Split in Three. Daryl and I connected immediately, and her writing drew me into a world that I recognized, felt at home in, and which I am continual, continually fascinated, the South. Daryl's writing is iconic of the Southern female narrative. And what does that mean when I say the Southern female narrative? I'm not talking about Scarlett O'Hara, that's for sure. Think more like Thelma and Louise, but less spectacle. The women of Daryl's plays are loud, inappropriate, endless talkers saying absolutely nothing and everything all at once. They are funny, vulnerable, awkward people with a significant regional connection that clearly defines the way in which they both see and experience the world. They are heroes without allowing such acknowledgement. They are saviors without a halo. They are survivors, they are saints, and they are sinners. The culture of the Southeast, Mississippi in particular, is always present in her work, that is her home. 
The systematic oppression of black and brown people, the consistent degradation of all those not white, straight, cis males in this place is a character of its own within her plays. Daryl sits us in the middle of this conflict that lives in our history and in the South in our everyday lives and makes us fall in love with the good, the bad, the weak, and everything in between. Her characters speak in rhythms, the tune of rich Southern accents. And it is this very quality that drew me into her play, Split in Three. So we worked on the play for about four months. It was featured in a reading with Atlanta's Essential Theater, a company that only produces premieres of readings by Georgia playwrights. After that reading, it was awarded a workshop with Florida Repertory Theater as part of their play lab. Then Florida Rep produced the world premiere and they sold out the show to Roaring Houses. A year later, Aurora Theater in Lawrenceville, just outside of Atlanta, staged the second production of the play, and it received another production in Alabama the same year. Currently, it is being reviewed by Samuel French for potential publishing. Less than 10 years after the launch of her first produ professional production of Split in Three at Florida Rep, her resume has grown impressively, but most of her credits are Southern and local opportunities. Here's a list of production and development opportunities beyond Split in Three in the last years last eight years. Off-Broadway, Pop Art the Musical was featured in the New York Musical Theater Festival. Greyhounds was produced by a regional New York theater. Safety Net will receive its world premiere with Theatrical Outfit and its second production at Pinoscop Theater. The Flower Room premiered at Actors Express. Freed Spirits was a commission and world premiere through Horizon Theater. Her musical Lift with composer Aaron McAllister was awarded a slot in the NAMT Festival of New Musicals in New York City, as well as being developed at NYC's New York, NYC's York Theater and Coastal Carolina University. Her list of awards, selections, and recognition includes the Alliance Theater Riser Lab for Safety Net, O'Neill Playwrights Conference finalist for the same play, New York Musical Theater Festival Next Link selection for Pop Art, three-time Florida Rep Play Lab selection. Development workshops Daryl has been awarded are from Actors Express Threshold Festival, Synchronicity She Writes, Emory University Brave New Works, Truman State University, Seven Stages Homebrew Festival, Working Title Playwrights Ethel Wilson Lab, Florida Rep. Daryl received her BA in theater from Northwestern University and she also has an MFA in graphic design. Her production credits in the city of Atlanta alone is proof that Daryl Fazio is well loved, but I'd say it's high time the rest of the country experiences stories of the South, and Daryl's work is a perfect example. Why should we put Southern narratives in the spotlight, you might ask? The South is a place that combines cultures no one would ever believe would get along, but travel to Atlanta, Georgia, and you will experience a South you never knew existed. Metro Atlanta is majority African American and nearly 15% queer. In order to know the full diversity of what it means to be Southern and to live in the South, we have to tell the full story. Start with my talented friend and working title playwrights member, Daryl Lisa Fazio. Please let me know if you'd like me to connect you with her. She has wonderful, a wonderful website. It's under darylsplays.com, and that's Daryl's with an S. And she also has all of her plays on the New Play Exchange under Daryl Lisa Fazio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. Next up, Adam Goldstein. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, I'm Adam Goldstein, I'm an assistant professor of theater at Northeastern Illinois and the, uh, and the incoming artistic director of NEIU Stage Center Theater, and I'm here to speak about my visionary friend uh, and collaborator, Georgette Kelly. As a new part of the Goodman Theater's Playwrights Unit, I suppose that puts her on the radar. Um, but I believe that her strong record of development, astounding imagination, and open heart suggest her as incredibly deserving of more exploration and full productions. Georgia is currently self-represented, but is the writer of nine full-length plays, including Portrait, which will receive its first reading coming up at the Goodman on July 5th, Fuck La Vie de Artiste, receiving a reading at Diversionary Theatre Spark Festival on July 23rd, North Star, which will be workshopped in the Headwaters New Play Festival in August at Creedy Rep in Colorado, and Ballast, which received recognition as part of the Kilroy's List in 2015. She's written numerous short plays as well as a teacher and teaching artist and creates challenging, accessible work for adult young audiences, has won the first Hope on Stage Playwriting Award, as well as the San Diego Critics Circle Award for Best New Play, finalist at yada yada yada, a million other awards and fellowships, and completed her MFA at Hunter College. 
So maybe not under the radar, but in my view, at least underproduced. I first met Georgette while I was an MFA directing student at Northwestern, and she an employee in our department, and had no idea that she was this genius writer. I encountered her just in my own little narrow grad school world as efficient, professional, polite, polished, and quiet. I encountered Georgette's work after the 2016 election, and reckoned with a writer whose words, characters, and vision exploded in poetic, visceral, epic, intimate, and beautifully rough and real ways and loudly trumpeted what I call the necessary imagination of the heart, to its audience like a reminder that we are still here and still human. And I don't know about the rest of the room here, but following the election, um, I sure need to feel like magic still existed in the world, and that heart still sought beauty somewhere. And additionally, it came as a bit of a refreshment to see that Georgette's work was political, but the political bend lay in exploring the ramifications of the world around us on our internal life. She weighed how visibility is taken and lost, and how challenging self-reclamation in the face of crisis might be. I'm here now speaking to you as a current collaborator of hers at NEIU, as we're proud to host a two-year developmental process of her gorgeous How to Hero, or the Subway Play, which we're producing in partnership with Film and Theater Ensemble, a leading Chicago professional company producing works for all audiences. For me as a director, what sparks personally in her work is the sense that the heart is always missing a piece of itself. In some of her plays, this missing piece is identity. In others, it's a critical lost companion, but in all cases, Georgette's characters seek very real things and are forced to look for them in very magical ways. She reminds us that to find solutions to impossible moments, we must often do the impossible. Kelly's mentor, Tina Howe, has described her work as being at best when it's vertical. Her play's dreamscapes often travel through extreme heights and depths. She's interested in honesty and reality, alternative reality, spirituality, and magical realism. Her characters may learn how to fly, or descend into subway tunnels, or get themselves swallowed by whales in order to reclaim themselves, such as in my personal favorite of her work, Jonah and the Belly of the Whale. From um, her stage directions are poetry, small plays unto themselves, and expand our notion, our visual notion of what constitutes reality, because in many cases in the pedestrian world, it too often lacks the answers we need to our most intimate questions. So we visit other universes, crawl through tunnels, and reckon with the magic that is us. Georgette's work, as she puts it, is hopefully a playground for her collaborators and a unique puzzle in which to solve how to stage that impossible. From a producer's perspective, I get it. Her work is intimidating on the page. It's big. It makes us ask amazing questions of our design teams, and it looks crazy and silly expensive at first. But at the end of the day, she sees inside all of us in a special way, and I think that she would simply respond to the challenges with there are just many ways to solve the puzzle, Adam. Georgette self-identifies as queer, and that perspective plays a critical role in her storytelling as she gravitates towards stories that explore the layers of that identity, as well as in stories that center relationships of women and children. She shines lights on those who need it most, and finds a way to make each member of an audience fully visible with honesty, empathy, and love. Audiences both young and old are moved by her work, and I hope that many of you in the regional world will find space in her stories for your audiences, too. You can find out more about her philosophy in the new play Exchange, uh, and also the website listed on your handout. And we thank you. Thank you, Adam. G. Hey, Kim. Um, the playwright, two female playwright, I'll be briefly introduced uh, to all of you, are both from Seoul, South Korea. Their last names happen to be both Hwang, but they're not related, other than the fact that they're both up-and-coming female power in South Korea. Um, for the time purposes, I'm going to focus more on one playwright than the other, but I'll leave a hook for the other playwright so they can come talk to me and grab me whenever you have time. Uh, first playwright, her name is Hejong Hwang. Hejong Hwang might take years to write one play, but her play is tight and sharp in terms of plot and timing. Based on realism, I would dare to say she has a trace of Arthur Miller's plot and Tennessee Williams' characters. Ooh. But I feel it, 
so I want to say it to honor her work. Hence, her works have been actors' favorite, grabbing and shaking the audience's heart through the inevitable yet razor sharp dramatic fall in the climax of these desire packed yet enigmatic, juicy characters that you can find every subway station in the opposite side of Gangnam, South Korea. Um, yes, she sounds just like all American family living room drama following after Miller and Williams, yet she does not waste a single moment on stage. Every moment an action is happening and the plot is moving, moving <laughs> forward and she doesn't give any time for the audience to sit back and relax. Um, starting her career as a winner of the 2013 National Theatre Center of Korea's New Play Festival for her first ever play, Merry Christmas, or in Korean, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hedang has written Strangers, or Jinan literally translated as Land Without an Owner, a contemporary family tragedy of Korean American immigrant family in Southern California, has won the 2015 Arts Council of Korea's Young Arts Frontier Grant in Literature. The play begins with an ex used car dealer in uh, Southern California, whom she a small business, went down and his son Andrew returns from the war, uh, Iraq war with glory and trauma. After its initial run in 2016, Strangers has traveled the city of Gwangmyeong, Kung Po in 2018, has, and has invited to the Bird Festival in Totori, Japan in 2018. The actual play that I want to introduce today is called, actually called Chinese Cabinet. It's a really fancy cabinet that I guess only known to some East Asian. Very fancy, very expensive cabinet, so hence the title. Um, Chinese Cabinet 2017, the story is about a family of arsonists. Uh, the story begins with a burnt house, a uh, missing father's death notice, the reunion of the shadow family that consists of a mother, a son, and a daughter who came back from Canada for the ghost funeral, a funeral without body of her father, and the last but not the least, her Canadian Indian boyfriend, David. <laughs> the play isn't shy about hiding the fact that someone in the family has set a fire on their previous house with glory. The tightly woven plot chases down who, how, and why of the fire, asking the audience questions of, in the era where the uncertainty provokes a constant state of anxiety, would all the wrongdoing we commit become a sin? What makes us anxious, and why? The play has, was inspired by Hejong's personal encounter to witnessing an apartment of fire when she was little. I saw the reading of this play in the winter of 2017 in Seoul at the National Theatre Center of Korea's Emerging Playwright Reading Series, Into the Writer's Room. I was fascinated by Hejong's keen insight towards crude human desire. I was also mesmerized by the imagery created in the pinnacle of the climax. I couldn't stop talking about the show when I returned to Santa Barbara. Fast forward, Hejong got the Art Council of Korea's International Residency Grant this year, and her play, Chinese Cabinet, was chosen to be translated as a part of her international portfolio. And surprise, I got to work with her as her dramaturgical translator and adaptator. She will be spending three months at Slovenia researching for her new plays. So I put it out there for you to grab me to talk more about her play, and to very briefly, the other playwright that I would like to just briefly mention, her name is Chung Hwang, another playwright. Um, she writes about the relationship between nature and human, nation technology, and science and technology. Her writing style is very poetic, vastly different from Hejang. But for the time's sake, feel free to grade me for more information or questions. I'm willing to talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jihoon. Courtney Knight. Hi guys, my name is Courtney Knight. I'm a dramaturg based in New York City. Um, there will be a handout about my playwright, Bo Ryan McCoy. They are in black and white. There is one random color one. If you get that, please pass it to the most successful person you know. I am trying to impress the right type of people. Um, so McCoy he lives in Monterey, California. He is a public school educator in addition to being a playwright. I first met him in undergrad at California State University, Long Beach. He was a very successful performer and director, so him also becoming a very successful playwright seems like a natural progression to me. 
Uh, some common themes in his work include freedom, fear, change, and appropriately fear of change. Although his work has always been very personal and very representative of him being a queer man, he does find his work is also becoming increasingly political, obviously at least in part due to the current political climate. Political, political climate. Uh, when it comes to genre, McCoy prefers not to label himself, but often describes his writing as running the gamut from absurdism to magical realism and always coming from a self-described humanist perspective. Uh, to get the idea of the caliber of the work McCoy produces, some major playwright inspirations for him include Tony Kushner, Annie Baker, Annie Baker and Eric Bogosian, and their influence is always readily apparent when reading his work. As he has performance experience, it makes sense that he thinks of himself as a performer's playwright, meaning dialogue is always at the forefront of his work, and his plays are just veritable gold mines for actors looking for meaty monologues or scenes that provide a challenge while still being very relatable. His work is really ideal for college age productions as the material is dramaturgically uh, stimulating and also can be worked to suit minimalist staging and sets. Uh, some of his plays I'd like to highlight, uh, Cockfight, a one act about a group of men participating in the first human cockfight, uh, Queen Queenie, an absurdist two act about a newly minted tyrannical queen meeting her subjects for the first time and immediately encountering opposition from within her, within her own house, and F or Chariot Sounds, which is four acts about two ex-lovers who come together, each seeking forgiveness, and one making the transition towards death while experience, uh, experiencing a series of otherworldly divine visitors coming to his deathbed. McCoy is a playwright who is incredibly accessible. Uh, he is dedicated to being in contact as much as needed by the director and or dramaturg. He has had his work produced in both Los Angeles, California by the Urban Theater Movement, as well as in Long Beach, California by the Found Theater in their uh, new play festival in 2017. And he managed to coordinate and communicate with those folks despite the distance of, between Monterey and uh, Southern California, which geographically is pretty far. Um, however, by that same token, he is wonderfully hands-off and uh, is very open and excited to see the choices made by directors and actors. He does not believe in being too precious with one's own work, so you don't have to worry about a writer leaning over your shoulder and giving notes. Um, but yes, to summarize, I think Bo Ryan McCoy has a very distinct voice that addresses both timely and timeless issues, and he is, uh, without a doubt, a rising playwright to watch out for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney. Mark Lord. Uh, so I'm just going to speak to you briefly um, with the intention of persuading you to visit the website of the creator that I'm going to speak to you about. Uh, her name is Annie Wilson, and her uh, website uh, which I just tweeted out at the beginning of the session, uh, is theanniewilson.com. Um, if you visit, uh, you'll get to see lots of fancy quotes about what a, a well-appreciated uh, performer creator she is. You can also um, ask to be able to view video of her work there. Um, and I think that would be a good idea. She's a, a, an artist, a relatively young artist, whose work really deserves to be um, seen more than it has been. Uh, she's a Philadelphia-based um, performer, creator. Uh, she actually describes herself as a choreographer, performer, director, writer, bartender. Uh, a relatively popular, like super hyphenated uh, way of, of getting through. Um, I want to talk to you about my experience seeing two of her pieces uh, because I think that um, her work is different than other artists. Um, first, I'm going to speak to you about a piece called Lover Tits, a uh, one word, um, which is a, a performance uh, that Annie directed, features three <coughs> female-bodied performers uh, who are largely clothesless for the duration of the performance. Um, it's the most amazing uh, representation of the naked body that I've ever witnessed in a theater. 
um, bodies are, uh, she talks about on her website about how uh, one of the sort of founding thoughts for the, the piece was how amazing it is that we have bodies. Um, and I think that sense of awe and amazedness about physicality um, helps her in that work um, to let bodies be sexy but not only sexy, <coughs> playful but not only playful, um, inviting being seen but not only being seen, um, and to, over the course of the mm, probably 70 or 80 minutes of the performance, uh, to really sidestep the gaze of an audience, to allow the bodies to simply be, um, and to be funny without being self-deprecating, um, to be real in, in the ways that um, perhaps we come to know our own bodies over time in the privacy of our own homes, being able to like see bodies in performance like that. So you should check that out. The second piece that I want to talk to you about briefly is um, a piece called, I want to get the title correct, At Home with the Humorless Bastard. <laughs> uh, which is a solo performance that Annie made um, on the heels of uh, experiencing catastrophic loss in her own personal life. Um, and it is a representation that does with grief and grieving and the experience of loss what Lover Tits does with nakedness, uh, which is to, through uh, a series of performance actions, singing, engaging the audience, um, allowing herself to uh, be kind of radically present with the audience at the performance, um, uh, to let grief and the feelings of grief really just sit in the room with the audience uh, in the gruesome, kind of schlumpy, depressed way that we actually experience loss, that I actually experience loss. Um, and the piece is fascinating. Um, it's for one performer. It deserves to be seen. It deserves to travel. Um, Annie's not a playwright. She's a maker of live performance. Um, and I want to say, just before I, before I split, A, visit her website, theannywilson.com, uh, and B, the work of performer creators, because it doesn't get written down in, in texts, really languishes if we don't make the effort to see it um, and share it, and hers is work that needs to be shared some more. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Juliana Marchese. Juliana Marchese, pronouns she, her, hers. I feel like I found lightning in a bottle. My friend and Chicago director said this to me months ago about an LA playwright he had found on the internet. Ellen Steed's work, as Justin said, is electric. Her plays are about power, politics, manipulation, and endurance. She writes strong ensemble plays, two of which I'm gonna to talk to you today about. The first is Thin Mints. A troop of Girl Scouts retreat into a woodland cabin for 10 days for fishing, fun, and friendship. On the last night of their stay, the results of an ancient ceremony revealed the witch scout will be elected to take over the troop and replace their current scoutmaster. The girls manipulate, terrorize, torture, and uh, in one another in the hopes of receiving the nomination. This is a quote from Ellen. Thin Mints is based on the Shakespeare five-act history structure. Looking back on it, it is also a reflection of the absurdity of the 2019, uh, 2016 election. Uh, Thin Mints also scores a 100 out of 100 on the Bechdel test. There is no single mention of men, no brothers, no fathers, lovers, etc. But <laughs> by removing romance altogether, Thin Mints explores who women are when they are not in love. What's left is a story about greed, power, addiction, torture, and ruthlessness. The second play I want to talk to you about is called Talk Locker, a triptych. This play is in search of a workshop. 
when Justin and I first began talking to Ellen, she shared two separate short plays with us. Both of them took place in exclusively masculine spaces. Justin suggested that both of these plays could go together and be rounded out by a third piece. Uh, the result is a gut-wrenching, full-length play in three parts about toxic masculinity and suffering. But most of all, it is a play about brotherhood. Uh, in this, the first part of this triptych, or triptych, mm -hmm. is called Frat Pie. It is a real-time enactment of an induction ceremony for Alpha Kappa Lambda. Chad, their fearless and sadistic leader, forces his new brothers to take part in a game widely known as Soggy Waffle. According to Ellen, at a reading of this play, people had to leave the room to throw up. Uh, it is he, yeah. It is, a, it is a grueling and hilarious 16 minutes that ends with the line, you stand before me and I call you my brother. The second part of the triptych is called Trenches. Trenches is a story about a group of men who are forgotten by a war that rages on around them. Abandoned in the trenches and left for dead, the soldiers are severed from the outside world. While their supplies dwindle, they begin to create their own social systems with its own code of laws and ethics. Power becomes the most important commodity. As their situation deteriorates, secrets about each of them rise to the surface. Some descend into madness, some are awakened, some die. The third part of the play is called Charisma, Uniqueness, Nerve, and Talent, is a working title. Uh, C-U-N-T is an up-to-the-date minute examination uh, of gender presentation now. Divorced from realism, this third piece explores barbarism and savagery in personal beauty. It imagines a future where beauty standards are imposed on men to a draconian degree. The third piece of this play, called Talk Locker, is still in development. It's brand new, still fluid, still mercurial. Uh, and it is in need of a community to finish sculpting it. Um, so you have Ellen's email. I'm also happy to give you my email so I can send you the place directly. Um, and she's also in the new play exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Brian Court. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm Brian Quirt. I'm the artistic director of Night Swimming in Toronto. I'm also the uh, uh, chair of the board of LMDA. And I'm going to take a moment just before I begin to welcome you on behalf of the board of LMDA to Chicago and to the conference. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to have you here. Um, I also um, I'm here to speak about Jeff Ho. Uh, Jeff and I uh, live and work in Toronto, and I wanted to say that we're grateful to work and create on the territory of the Wendat, the Petun, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit, on territory that's subject to the dish with one spoon covenant between the um, Haudenosaunee and the Wendat nations. And I'm also a caretaker of land uh, north of Toronto on the territory of the uh, Wendat and Anishinaabe nations. Um, Jeff Ho is a remarkable playwright who, over the last couple of years, has not only been a playwright, but also a dramaturg um, and a teacher educator, um, and uh, has been the playwright resident at Night Swimming two seasons ago. More recently, he completed a dramaturgy internship with Night Swimming. I'm here to speak about three of his newest plays, two of which premiered in the past season alone. The three plays are uh, Trace, a solo play that premiered at Factory Theatre two seasons ago. The second is Iphigenia and the Furies on Torian Land, which premiered uh, this winter in Toronto in a spectacular production. And the third one is a version of Antigone that premiered at Young People's Theatre um, just this spring in uh, April-May. Um, the first of those, Trace, is a solo play that is, uh, in fact, Jeff is in rehearsal right now in Toronto for a revival of Trace, a solo play that he also performs, he's a spectacular actor as well, um, that is being revived and going into production for a run at the National Arts Centre in Ottawa this fall. Um, it traces four generations of women, uh, inspired by Jeff's own uh, ancestors, um, from China to Hong Kong and on to Canada. One of the unique features of it is that uh, there are no male voices in the play. The male voices are entirely captured by piano. Jeff is also um, an outrageously good pianist. And uh, the piano and the, the um, uh, positive and negative uh, role of the piano and of musical education is hugely important in the play. Uh, and um, as are games of Mahjong, 
which also uh, mm -hmm. trace uh, the, the journey from uh, Hong Kong to Canada. Um, hugely recommended, and in fact, it is being published this fall, and there will be a yellow or goldenrod um, handout passed out after my uh, little speech, um, and you can contact the publisher or his agent through that. The second piece is um, uh, a really superb version of Iphigenia uh, and the uh, Furies on Torian land, um, which was premiered this winter. Um, it is an ingenious distillation of the classic play that explores gender, queer relationships, um, and most importantly, and most scorchingly and urgently, um, the uh, enduring colonization of indigenous peoples in um, Canada and their nations. Um, it, it makes a huge twist in the second half of the play that is truly shocking and powerful, and I and, and silenced the audience when I saw it on opening night. I have to say, it's also, at least the earlier part of the play, extremely funny. Um, the third one is Antigone, a new version that Jeff was commissioned to create for young people, at Young People's Theatre, for high school students. Um, it's a, a, an excellent adaptation that, in fact, has become a new play through the process, essentially, um, which draws on the characters of Antigone um, and some of the plot points in, of Antigone, especially around betrayal and about um, uh, leadership and moral action. Um, but it draws on and it is set in a place like Hong Kong, although Hong Kong is not named, and draws on the Red Umbrella protests of several years ago. Uh, and in fact, Red Umbrellas are the only props in the show. They serve uh, to make all the props in all the environments of the show. Um, and it's been very prescient about the current and uh, ongoing um, acts of resistance in the streets of Hong Kong right now. Um, it is very much about resistance uh, and uh, um, the capacity of humans to come together to um, confront uh, authoritarianism. His writing is potent, perhaps I would say even spectacular in its use of language, and uh, he has an intuitive sense, as all of these shows, as you can tell perhaps, um, in terms of how to weaponize language and words. He is um, uh, uh, very productive. He has several new works in um, various states of completion at the moment. I would urge you to look up his work. The handout that will be passed around in a moment uh, is for the publication of the play, which you can trace, which comes out this fall. At the bottom, there's also um, the email and contact information for his agent in Canada um, uh, at Catalyst, Ian Arnold. And it's Ian Arnold's birthday today, so that feels appropriate and lovely. So, Jeff Ho, I hope you uh, track his work down. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to get like 30 seconds so and I can just distribute it before you get okay. started. Uh, this thing called the New Play Exchange, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, it is a website. Uh, it is a um, become essentially a, a um, um, best way to describe it. It's, a, it's kind of a database, but it's a it's a, a place where individuals can, where playwrights can share their materials for the purposes of um, potential uh, production in the future. Um, it's become a place where people can actually give feedback or reviews of the uh, scripts, uh, as much as the scripts that the playwright is willing to share. Um, it's a place where um, uh, playwrights can provide their contact information so people can reach out to them. But it's also a, so a space for um, uh, dramaturgs and directors and other artists uh, throughout the theater community um, for dramaturgs, it's an opportunity to learn about, well, dramaturgs and literary managers, I should say, it becomes an opportunity, a uh, resource to find new plays. Um, you can keyword search through a uh, new play exchange. So if you are looking for uh, particular plays that are about certain topics or uh, by individuals of different demographics, um, you can search them accordingly and it will help uh, filter to identify the people that you're looking for. Um, it's, uh, again, um, we can provide reviews for each other to help those playwrights in terms of their process of development. Uh, theater companies also use it for um, publishing or announcing um, submission opportunities, festivals and submission opportunities. Um, and so playwrights can flag, you know, kind of give their own keywords for their work. And if the festival highlights certain uh, themes or topics or demographics, um, uh, they can flag certain festivals that will work for their work, um, which is kind of a really neat source as well. Uh, so it's got a lot of different purposes, um, and it's just a 
dang awesome website. Um, we, uh, LMDA, uh, actually offers a reader discount uh, for people who want to register or who want to become a member of the New Play Exchange. Um, I believe it's, um, I think the price is normally $12. We have an LMDA discount. $12 for the year, thank you, um, um, but uh, the discount is $9 for the year. So um, please feel free to uh, get in touch with Lindsay Barr at the registration table if you want more information on how to get that discount. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, if you are an artist of other kinds, uh, there's a reader um, uh, account, but there's also a playwright account, a company account, etc. You can, um, those are different payments. Um, in amounts, um, and there might be a way to do some combinations and such. So, um, there's just um, they're very um, um, amenable to um, your situations um, in terms of how you want to use it. So, um, I'm not sure if Gwydion is going to be here this weekend or not. Um, I have to check with um, Martine and Lindsay about that. Um, but he's very approachable as well. If you want to contact the the main person, um, he's very good about that. We were one of their original sponsors, but if you haven't been on in the last, I would say, year, they have made some incredible improvements, mm -hmm. and they have made it so easy to contact playwrights directly, and so you writers and you dramaturgs, you need to get back on because you will be shocked at how much cleaner the equipment is now. Yeah, so um, it's a great site. They are always updating to make it um, as user friendly as possible. So they're really, really good people. Really good, really good resource. So take advantage of it. So New Play Exchange. It's newplayx.com. Is, that right? is it the? Is just the whole thing now? Okay, okay. So newplayexchange.org. If I may, I would also say I asked Woody to come to Texas last yeah. fall, and he came to pitch because we have so many writers. And I, I just haven't been looking the way I should have regionally. I didn't know until I went in and searched geographically. We have like 30 something Texas playwrights on there already. Mm -hmm. But I think he signed up five or six in the process of them just seeing it. And if I were a young writer or I were working with a young writer, I think you gotta be Kukumanga, not to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But you can also look for drama tricks as well. Um, so finding, getting your, getting yourself on there as a dramaturg um, is a great opportunity as well. So, um, okay, I'm going to stop now because we have a couple more uh, and I'm excited to hear these last couple people. So next is Rebecca Suella. Usually deal with microphones, so here we go. Hi, I'm Rebecca Suella. I am a writer, director, dramaturg based in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm also the associate development artist with Working Title Playwrights, which is where I met Theron Darcy Patterson. Uh, he is an, an amazing member of Working Title, and I would be remiss not to introduce his words uh, in this speech, so that's where I'm going to start. Uh, Theron has said, every couple of years, I write something that comes out of my concern for where we are as a society, where we are as an American society, what that identity really means, and what it means if something threatens it or takes it away. I'm always wondering what are the circumstances that would lead us to come face to face with who we are as a society, and what happens if all the old rules don't apply anymore. This line of questioning is fascinating to me, and it comes to beautiful, beautiful life in Theron's work and something that I casually call a personal post-apocalyptic. Now, being from Atlanta, we're the home of the Walking Dead. We're kind of over the post-apocalyptic thing in general on the whole. Uh, but what Theron is able to do is uniquely ground the explosion of a world and the simultaneous rebuilding of that world by engaging a sort of mystical realism more than magical realism and creating these wildly liminal spaces. Uh, I first encountered his work with a play called The Wilderness, which starts with a traumatic event that launches three women, uh, a la, but not so on the nose as this, the triple goddess, some maiden mother crone action going on there, launches them into this uh, absolutely indistinct world that is both natural and unnatural, that is full and empty and forces them to sort of come into contact with each other until they can incorporate one another. Uh, that sort of inflection of 
encapsulating the people that we encounter, the way that we attract them because we need them, is pervasive throughout his work, and it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, the next play that I, when I actually got to work with him, I directed a reading of his piece, The Rut, which, again, liminal, uh, clever wordplay, deals with both a marriage that is in a rut in the wake of some infidelity, and The Rut, which is a season in which young bucks, I think is the right word for male deer, uh, grow their horns, go around banging them into everything, and then mate. So uh, that, uh, and in that work, the, the female identifying person in the couple uh, comes to find a, a dying buck pre-rut, and he coaches her through integrating her own animus uh, as she tries to reclaim her sexuality in the wake of the rejection in her marriage. Um, his work is absolutely staggering, and I wish I could give you guys his website, but among his many, 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 many skills, uh, it's not self-promotion, which is why I am here and delighted to uplift him. He has no website. He is not on the new play exchange. I do my best, y'all. But he does, <laughs> he does know I'm here and talking about him, and he has given me permission for uh, to open up you guys to contact me, and we can put you guys directly in touch. So I have a little handout. I hope I have enough. I think I only had 20. But my email is associate at workingtitleplaywrights.com. Uh, again, my name is Rebecca Suella. Feel free to approach me or my cohort, Amber Bradshaw, who has also worked with Theron and can sing his praises to the moon just like I can. I think that's all I have. Let me check my little list because it's pretty extemporaneous. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Rebecca. Gavin Wood. Representing Baltimore. Um, very briefly, here to sing the praises of, with no actual singing, no worries, uh, my friend, the playwright, Anna Munch, um, uh, a native Baltimorean, so honoring the local uh, in that respect, uh, who first came to my attention courtesy of the wonderful Jeremy Cohen at the Playwright Center uh, as she moved through Minneapolis uh, when she was then a New York based playwright with some recent successes uh, around 2011, including uh, a production at 59 East 59th, uh, play the pillow book. Um, so some success, uh, a little bit of blip on the radar, uh, and a representative of kind of multiple communities and multiple local uh, identities. Uh, we invited Anna uh, on the strength of that meeting and her work to be the inaugural resident hot desk playwright at Center Stage, um, where her parents have been longtime subscribers, which was kind of wonderful. Um, and she had two weeks uh, to complete a full rehearsal draft of a play before she was leaving on a cross-country bike trip uh, and then starting rehearsal for a, so she'd been commissioned to write this play for the graduate acting cohort at NYU. So she had to finish this. If you want to read about the bike trip, the blog 300 Snickers a Day uh, is amazing and charts their, uh, this two-person bike trip across the country. I, I can't recommend it enough. Another way of getting access to her voice. But anyway, right, so she had these two weeks, and she said what she wanted was time at center stage uh, with uh, a just casual group of actors and a kind of daily accountability. So she would write, uh, and we would gather some staff and volunteers and interns, uh, and uh, we'd read what she'd written, and then we would discuss it, and then she'd go off and read some more. At the end of the week, she had a draft of the play, and then she went off and rode her bike. Uh, the, uh, so it's just really more a portrait of kind of the way that she works, deeply unprecious, as some have pointed out about uh, these other playwrights, uh, but with an incredible sense of committed dedication to the work and uh, uh, really producing. Um, at the same time, while she was working on that, we commissioned her to, as one of 50 playwrights to write for our My America project, uh, the first of three of these, uh, to explore in a, a short monologue kind of what America meant to that playwright. So she generated that and a full-length play draft over the course of her residency. Um, I then continued to collaborate a little bit 
with her a little bit on a musical she was working on with the Lark uh, <laughs> about uh, sort of a newsworthy at the time uh, homicidal love triangle involving NASA astronauts, you may remember. Oh. Uh, you know, basic, typical musical. Um, <laughs> um, Anna's work, I find, is always grounded in emotional and psychological truths, as extreme as those might be in conditions, circumstances like that, uh, or the piece that she worked on for the NYU cohort that she worked on with us about a group of uh, young post-college uh, freegans uh, who retreat uh, to a kind of upstate uh, abandoned house and may or may not find themselves in the midst of the apocalypse. Uh, if only they had cell phones and could check, but they don't. Um, uh, so always grounded in emotional and psychological truths, though uh, really much more theatrical and expansive than straight realistic uh, in really exciting and engaging ways. Again, I find that uh, her plays always seem to explore or probe or circle around the questions of identity, which we've heard so much about, and I think you could say many plays do, ultimately, but uh, watching her own navigation and evolution of understanding her identity as an Asian American playwright, as a woman playwright, uh, as a playwright, uh, as now recently an MFA graduate from UCSD, who's also a new mother, uh, all of these formulations of identity very much individually play in uh, and shape her exploration, but how the past and the present can shape possible futures and uh, who we are relative to who we might want to be, how we're perceived. Um, the plays also focus very particularly on women in what I was given to call unexpected circumstances that are not unexpected to them, so much as unexpected according to the conventions and tropes and narrative formulations that so many of us are used to encountering. Uh, and so they're always surprising. Um, she can be found at animunch.com or on the New Play Exchange. She's repped by Ali Schuster at CAA. Uh, a couple productions coming up at Interact in Philly uh, and some small regional productions. She's working on a new play about an actor who's trapped Groundhog Day-like huh. in endless productions of the same Productions of the Christmas Carol at a small regional theater. Um, right, you can imagine. Um, but it's, I want to leave with Anna's own words. Um, I'm interested in how our dreams can become an albatross. We sometimes cling to old identities out of fear or shame or nostalgia. And being able to put that down is a meaningful step towards growth and happiness. Please check out her work. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Okay, this concludes the, the formal presentation portion of the, of the session. Uh, we have about, I don't know, 25 or so minutes, uh, which is great. Uh, so we've got a couple different ways that we can go about this. Uh, if you, I want to kind of open it up to all of you, and then including our <coughs> presenters. Uh, if you have a question or thought about any of the um, playwrights um, that you have heard today, um, this would be a great time to share that. Um, we, again, these are kind of advocates for their work, um, and we definitely need to be advocates for those who we work with, um, in no matter whatever capacity they work in. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, many of these, uh, many of the presenters know these playwrights, so that's great, um, and so they can support in that way. Um, again, uh, many of these playwrights are also on the New Play Exchange, uh, newplayexchange.org, you can check that out. Uh, but um, I also want to say, this is a great time that if you have a playwright of your own right now, that you want to give about a minute or two spiel about that uh, people should be um, thinking about or looking out for. Uh, this is a great time to do it as well. Um, we're taking notes, so <laughs> feel free to uh, absolutely share that information as well. So um, I want to take some time to just kind of open it up to you all. Uh, questions, thoughts, and recommendations, etc. And we'll take the mic around and uh, get that um, get that ball going. So okay. Uh, so any questions? Uh, this works out well, I have one. I just want to re-advocate for the New Play Exchange and just to say on behalf of our colleagues at NMPN that they are not, for many of them are not here this weekend because their annual conference is in Kansas City right now. So 
that's why we're missing them. I'm on the Affiliated Artist Council of NMPN. If you have any questions about that or the new play exchange, you can also come find me. Thank you. There's a mic right there. Oh, thank you. I have a playwright, but I also want to advocate for a new session. I love these. This and Hot Topics make my heart go pitter-patter. But I think we also, and I'm saying this because I have so many playwright friends that I think, I need to tell you this story. Would you think about writing this? And they're all so deep into projects. And um, maybe some of these are better for students. But I think we need a session on, I have an idea for a play. And is anybody out there interested in it? So I would call that session Chasing Rabbits. Because I love to chase rabbits. So, may I throw a rabbit out right now and as an example? Go for it. So I met this woman through my husband, who's my best civil rights uh, African-American history dramaturg. And she wrote this book called Wednesdays in Mississippi. And it's another one of those stories that who the hell doesn't know this story? Everybody. Of these women during the civil rights movement who were very upset because men were running everything. Don't get me started on the movie Selma, I love her. But she got some of that stuff wrong. The women didn't get the credit they should have. So these women were African American women. They were Caucasian women. And they started meeting secretly in Mississippi. And they would fly in. This went on for two years. The moms would get together. They would, the Caucasian women would stay in hotels. They would find homes for the African American women. And they met regularly for two years to talk about how to bring it into segregation in America. Have you ever heard of that group? And now there's a book about it called Wednesdays in Mississippi. There are so many untold stories. And to do that, I want to promote a playwright whom I love and love working with. Uh, maybe some of you know her, C. Denby Swanson. Her name is Colin, C-O-L-I-N, but her playwriting official name is C. Denby Swanson. Colin is a smithy, and um, she is, of course, on the, the New Play Exchange and a graduate of the National Theater Institute, and then she was in the Mishner program, which if, if you read Todd London's book, you know it's one of the seven places where you can go and get produced. So the Mishner program for writers, she did screenwriting and playwriting at the University of Texas at Austin, and then she was the head of Austin Script Works and has worked with us when we did the Austin Conference. She's a Jerome Fellow McKnight Playwright Center. And when she was living in uh, Minneapolis, she got so interested in the culture, the Norwegian culture there. So her play, The Norwegians, if you haven't seen it, it's hysterical comedy, um, takes place in Minneapolis and it's about uh, hit men and, but they're nice. They're like really nice, and these women who are getting rid of their really bad ex-boyfriends. But then one of them changes her mind. That play ran off off Broadway, and it just kept getting extended and extended and extended. I know two actors who got their equity cards off of it. But anyway, so that's a really interesting play, The Norwegians. It's produced a lot. Um, Gabriela Polemic is another of her plays that if you're interested in great monologues, you for sure ought to look at it. It's about four women who have become in the custom over the years as friends of getting together for Seder dinners. And uh, it's about women who want to have children and who don't want to have children and one who gets pregnant because she's raped, one who is pregnant and loses a baby, and two who have done everything in the world to try to get pregnant and can't. And it's a hell of a dinner clash, and it too has been done um, off of Broadway. Great play, um, Gabriel. It's about do women ever have free will? Did Mary have free will? Okay. Um, and the the other one I wanted to talk about, which again is a great history play, and I had never heard of this one woman until Colin just wrote Nutshell. Nutshell. And I'm just going to read you quickly. It's a cast of three. It's biography, dark comedy, docudrama. And she manages to work into it what is happening right now with uh, conflict between the police and people who should have been left alone despite their color. But the play is actually about Frances Glessner Lee, who I had never heard of. She is the, in Baltimore, so you've probably heard of her, my dear. Um, she is the mother of modern forensic scientists and creator of the, the miniatures called the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. Uh, in the play, she hijacks a seminar on homicide investigation. 
in Baltimore. This woman was a wealthy woman. I think she was from Chicago and had a bad marriage and had a lot of money and got fascinated by creating miniatures. So she was creating tiny little dollhouses of nutshell size and ended up figuring out how could they be, they could be used to reconstruct crime scenes. And today the police revere her and there's a museum to her nutshell studies in Baltimore. So because she basically single-handedly invented this wealthy lady who didn't want another husband whose parents thought she was a wackadoodle, uh, how we do modern crime scene and how many, and mostly they were murders of women that were never solved. But they never at the time took the time to reconstruct crime scenes and figure out what really happened and who killed them. Now there's a whack, isn't it? So I think we need a chasing rabbit section too. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate it. Okay. Danny Joseph. Hey guys. Uh, so I actually have two, um, but I'll be very quick. So uh, one is my friend Nicole Zimmer, who has most recently been produced at The Gift uh, Theater. She is a disabled playwright, she has CP, and a lot of her plays deal with her disability, but she is also one of the funniest people I know. Oh my god, she's hilarious. Uh, she also um, writes, uh, she writes romance really well. Um, a lot of her plays are just steeped in longing, as well as comedy, um, and her dialogue just moves super fast. I can see her being snatched up by a TV executive, which is why I want her to be produced so that she stays in our world instead. Um, <laughs> uh, the play specifically of hers that I really enjoy, she's on the new play exchange. Um, the play of hers that I specifically enjoy is um, Eat Your Heart Out, which is a play about three sisters, sirens, um, who are trying to sort of live under the radar um, in an Alabama town. Um, they're trying to hide that they're sirens because they're on the run because one of them, who's a political activist, accidentally killed a senator's son, oops, um, and ate his heart. So uh, it, the play centers around one sister who um, was basically the victim of a hate crime which left her disabled and um, afraid of singing. Um, she falls in love with her neighbor. Her neighbor uh, cruelly rejects her and you'll have to see what happens next. Uh, so that's Nicole Zimmerer, Z-I-M-M-E-R-E-R. -E -E uh, and if you want to know more about her, I'm crazy about her, come to me. Um, I, I second everything about Nicole Zimmerer. Thanks, bud. Uh, <laughs> the other person, um, she's not so much under the radar, but in the service of performance artists, um, Diana O. She is um, in the Emerging Writers Group at the Public Theater. She was most recently produced at the Bushwick Star, I believe, um, with her play, The Infinite Love Party. And basically, Diana's shtick is that um, she wants to connect holistically and authentically with her audiences. So the Infinite Love Party is basically a slumber party, where you sit down and you talk about sex and love and your experiences with getting your heart broken and your experiences with falling in love with people um, with the hope that once you leave the infinite love party, you will have basically had a crash course in kindness and opening yourself up to other people um, and you will feel healed and whole. That's ba basically the ethos behind all of her work. Um, and she's a really lovely person. She runs workshops as well, um, sort of along the same themes. And I highly recommend you bring her to your theaters. That's Diana O, O-H, like the exclamation. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Any others? Hi, I hate my phone, so this will be brief. Um, I just want to do a brief shout out to a UK based player of mine. Um, her name is Kate O'Reilly. K A I T E O'Reilly. She's a disabled playwright and she has this awesome play called Peeling that focuses on three disabled actresses and 
is the first play that I've ever seen that focuses solely on disabled actresses. So, um, and she's never, well, that play has never been produced in the U.S., but I'm going to have the great honor to be the first dramaturg for that production that will be premiering in August. So, small, small self-promotion. <laughs> company on that, so um, I think that's everything. Check her out. She's a great player. K-A-I-T-E. Yes. Great. Thank you. And good luck with your show. Any others? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to, I'll perch here for a moment. Uh, I just wanted to uplift my friend Gavin Wood's advocacy of Anna Munch. I uh, saw Anna's work at the Wagner New Play Festival at UCSD last year, her play Mothers, which I consider the resurrection of Sarah Kane with Anna's unique style, and she, it was phenomenal. And I also really want to uplift that Anna is a tremendous activist, uh, and that is always part of her artistry. As part of the production of Mothers at Playwrights Realm, she, with the uh, artistic staff of Playwrights Realm, have created the Radical Parent Inclusion Project, which allows parent artists to be able to have more sustainable work weeks of five-day work weeks with six-hour rehearsal blocks, to have childcare on site, to hire more parent artists to be part of the process, and to also have matinees available uh, to be more accommodating to parents. So I think the way in which the play itself really speaks to, in Anna's wildly and original theatrical style, the challenge of parenting, and particularly motherhood, and what she's doing with that project is remarkable. I wanted to celebrate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. You, you guys made me think of one, one more I want to throw out there. If, if you haven't been to the public in New York this year, boy, they have been doing some amazing stuff in the last several months. And one of the pieces that, again, is very near and dear to my heart because one of my mentees, Stevie Walker Webb, his first directorial debut and just got huge reviews for Jordan Price's play, Ain't No Mo. If you've seen any of the publicity about it. Uh, uh, Jordan Cooper, I'm sorry, different player. Jordan Cooper is like 24 guys. And um, they came up through the new school together. Stevie is actually from from my Mission Wake Up Mission World project. So he came up through our project in, uh, in Waco, Texas. But he is an amazing talent, and it got booming reviews. And if you didn't see it. I have the PDF. Thank you, darling. Jordan's going to be something, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it is. Uh, I mean, I, the first time I saw George Wolfe's uh, Color Museum was actually at, in London. And I was like, why do these people understand all of this African American history? You know, most audiences in the United States wouldn't know what all these references are. So in a lot of ways, it's like the next step beyond the Color Museum. But the writing is just brilliant. Jordan E. Cooper. He's also in the show, or was in the show, they just closed because it was extended. Most nights, he, he, you know, the concept of the show, if you don't know it, it, it's a, an airline that's now a, we give up. Okay, it's over. <laughs> Back to Africa. And everybody getting on the plane. So it's a bunch of vignettes that are just beautifully written. Beautifully written. Um, but he also plays the stewardess all but one performance a week, the, the whole length of their run. So he's also an incredible actor, too. But I, I hope you'll watch for the name because not many people get their very first script done at the public to acclaim from the New York Times and every other press outlet. And um, by the way, Stevie Walker Webb, remember that name too, he's an incredible uh, caring artist and he actually just uh, won a, an OB recognition for his direction of his very first play. So look out for these fine young artists. And I will just say, um, as we wrap up, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up because I think we're winding down here. But um, if uh, this has more or less become an annual uh, session, 
So if you end up working with some new artists, uh, new uh, um, creators or playwrights, uh, absolutely consider sharing them with us um, through this session. Uh, we will be, but if we put out a call usually by about early spring or so, um, and it's a great opportunity to share a little bit about the people who you work with and to, and to uplift them and to promote them and to get them out there into um, kind of the wider theater world. Um, so we definitely appreciate that. Uh, but thank you all uh, for, your, um, for your ears, but also for your contributions. Um, and um, we will just kind of continue to talk together throughout this weekend and throughout the year. So um, thank you. Um, our next session is at 2.45. Uh, it's another set of concurrent uh, sessions, uh, both uh, panel as well as paper, papers and presentations. 